So, I finally did it. Almost 1100 chapters and half a year of reading every day later, I've somehow caught up with One Piece. And who would have thought that the most popular comic in the world was actually really good? But as the bittersweet joy of reading the current chapter swept over me, my lizard brain activated because this also meant I could finally go back through the 25 years of One Piece history and play all of the fighting games that the series has produced with more appreciation. From the oldest One Piece fighting game, to fan-made One Piece fighting games, and even crossover games with One Piece characters in them, if I could make Luffy do a combo against another player, I played it. But above all, there was one game I was particularly excited to play, because its existence is one of the reasons I even wanted to read the series in the first place, because it almost doesn't feel real in retrospect. Every fighting game and anime fan alike only dream of one thing, and that's for Arc System Works to give their favorite series the Dragon Ball Fighters treatment, because we're tired of every anime just getting another 3D arena fighter. But what if I told you that Arc System Works already made a One Piece fighting game, and it's a 2D tag fighter with beautiful sprite work, and it can connect to another 2D Dragon Ball fighting game for the ultimate Dragon Ball One Piece crossover fighter. Your eyes aren't lying to you. A 2D sprite-based One Piece fighting game has existed alongside a companion 2D sprite-based Dragon Ball fighter for years, and both were developed by Arc System Works. The caveat here is, of course, that they are both 3DS exclusives, and that the One Piece fighter sadly only released in Japan. While definitely not the ideal platform, being trapped on a portable doesn't mean these games don't have a lot to offer, so let's go over this extremely unique and fun crossover fighter. Releasing worldwide in 2015, Dragon Ball Extreme Potoden was the first of these games to come out, and when this was first announced I lost my mind and pre-ordered immediately. At the time I thought this had to be the way for Arxis to dip their toes into creating a full-fledged next-gen Dragon Ball tag fighter, which is something that obviously did come to fruition. But when I finally got my hands on it, I thought the game was great to look at, but a bit too basic and stiff for my taste, because I was hoping for a standard Marvel vs. Capcom styled affair but got something incredibly unique that I didn't fully grasp at the time. This wasn't helped by the fact that the game didn't even launch with an online mode, and by the time it got one 6 months later, I'd already stopped playing, cause getting friends together locally to play a niche 3DS fighter is a tough sell. So when Arxis released the Great Pirate Coliseum, which was a One Piece fighting game using the exact same engine and mechanics as Extreme Potodin only a year later, I completely skipped out on it, cause I wasn't a fan of One Piece or Extreme Potodin. Sadly, it also seems a lot of other people weren't interested, because the sales figures for both of these games aren't the best, even with what should have been the mega announcement that the two games were getting patched to allow battles between the two fighters, but with a slight restriction. Even though the two games share many similarities, these are still two separate games at the end of the day, so copies of Extreme Potodin could play against other copies of Extreme Potodin, and a copy of Great Pyre Coliseum can play against another copy of Great Pyre Coliseum, but where it gets a little bit unique, interesting, and a tad bit annoying is that copies of Extreme Potodin could match up against a copy of Great Pyre Coliseum, but only as their own individual games. This means you can have Goku, Trunks, and Boo face off against Luffy, Zoro, and Blackbeard, but you can't mix and match the two franchises. You're either Team Dragon Ball or Team One Piece, which totally makes sense when you stop and think of the metrics that these are two different games, but man, it would have been so cool if they let you put whoever wherever. This unique crossover implementation and the fact that the games were stuck on the 3DS had to have mellowed out much of the hype a Dragon Ball vs One Piece game should generate. But again, I wasn't losing sleep because I didn't even enjoy Extreme Potodin that much because I thought that the game didn't allow much freedom or creativity in its gameplay. But man, I was wrong. It wasn't until years after these games had been forgotten by most fighting gamers that I saw that the niche fighting game extraordinaire, Griffey Bones, had started posting match videos for the two games, and surprisingly, I found myself watching these videos and thinking to myself, wait, wait a minute, this is actually super sick. I thought these games were simple and boring. The match videos and tech being posted led me to join the One Piece DBZ 3DS Discord, where I found a whole group of dedicated players that were essentially breaking the ins and outs of both of these games, and doing stuff that looked cooler than most mainstream big budget fighting games. Everything that makes a fighting game fun and in-depth was all here in these tiny cartridges the whole time, and I just couldn't see it. 
and thanks to modern 3DS emulation, the community was able to actually use all of this tech they were finding to play online against each other. I was shocked and amazed by all of this, but sadly, I knew it wasn't my time to experience what these games really had to offer just yet. I mean, I saw an assist that was a grown man dressed as a baby doing a suplex on someone from the sky, and I didn't understand what my eyes were perceiving. I was just a simple Dragon Ball fan who was used to alien monkey boys. Nothing ridiculous like this. So I embarked on my half a year One Piece reading journey so I could come back and fully grasp the amazingness of Great Pyre Coliseum and its crossover with Extreme Potodon. And now that I'm caught up, yeah, I love One Piece. And I also have to admit that I had a very shallow understanding of these two games, because I was just too small minded to understand that limitations breed creativity. So let's finally go over how Extreme Potodon and Great Pyre Coliseum actually play. But going over how these games play is going to be a bit complicated because they share a lot of DNA with each other while also having their own differences. So I'll be switching between the two games freely while specifically highlighting what makes the two fighters unique when need be. Both Extreme Potodon and Great Pyre Coliseum are 2D tag fighters at their core, with there being playable characters and assist only characters to choose from. But there is no set team composition so you can get wild with your team ratios. If you want 3 playable characters and no assists, you can do that. If you want 1 playable character and 4 assists, you can do that. Or if you want to just pick 1 character and go solo, you'll probably lose, but you can also do that. The standard team size most players go for is 2 playable characters with 2 different assists. Cause it just makes sense. With this being a 3DS game, your team exists on the bottom screen. So you'd need to physically tap on the touchscreen to switch characters and use assists. Which is not ideal. But thankfully due to the modern conveniences of emulation, you can assign the touchscreen to buttons to make things feel more streamlined. I'm usually in an arcade stick purist, but this game doesn't really work optimally on stick. Cause you know it's a 3DS game. And assigning the touchscreen to buttons adds a lot of extra buttons. So I busted out the trusty 15 year old wired 360 pad for this one. The game's movement is similar to your standard 2D anime fighter. You got air dashes and double jumps, along with a button that's dedicated for a forward moving dodge. But everything else is pretty unique in implementation. So you have three main attack buttons, with them being a light, strong, and a unique action button. Sometimes the unique action button can be a big attack, or it could be a projectile, or even just a grab, and so on and so forth. But all these buttons get weirder because they don't really chain how you think your typical anime game buttons would. So there's no light, into medium, into heavy combos that cancel into special moves, or even just normally chaining buttons in general. Instead, each button has a different combo string that they can lead into. A lot of these strings are universal, like mashing light several times will do a combo leading into a wall bounce, or hitting two lights into a strong will do a launcher that can lead into an air combo. But many of these strings are character specific in utility. Special moves are done by holding L and pressing the light attack for a universal overhead or the strong attack for a move that costs 25 meter. If you hold L and hit the unique action button, you get a big damage super that costs 50 meter. But you can also end combos by doing a special string that every character has that launches the opponent into a rock paper scissors type guessing game or another universal string that you can spend meter on to do a super dramatic animate cutscene attack. The guessing game attack really sucks and you're probably never going to use it. While the ultimate anime cutscene attack does good damage, but it's kind of never worth going for because you could be using your meter for much better stuff. Like spending 25 meter to do a super dash for Dragon Ball characters or a teleport for One Piece characters. Which are both extremely important for combo extensions and have their own unique pros. The super dash is an extremely fast moving hitbox that you can combo off of easily while the teleport is a great mix up tool that literally removes your hurtbox for a bit. I think it's really cool that they essentially do the same thing for you, but in different ways. Also the super dash costing some kind of meter feels pretty good. And speaking of differences, the two games do have their own unique mechanics. Like Dragon Ball characters can charge their key to raise their meter, while One Piece characters can activate deadly engine mode, which gives every character a unique buff or different move properties altogether while also letting you spend as much meter as you want while it drains away slowly. A Kainu's Puddle normally is just used for mix-ups, but in Deadly Engine Mode, the Puddle itself gets a hitbox. And then there's Guild's Aegis Reflector move, 
which literally becomes unblockable when in deadly engine mode. I feel sorry for the Dragon Ball fans, because this is just a million times cooler than key charging. And finally, you also get one burst per match once your life pulls under 50%, which is fantastic because bursts make every game better. But you also can't have a fighting game made after 2010 without a comeback mechanic. So there's also a pseudo X-Factor type mode you can activate that buffs your characters, while also draining your health at the same time. So what initially turned me off about these games was how stiff the button and combo structure feel at first glance. It didn't seem that there was much choice or room for experimentation, because all you could do was strings, and you couldn't cancel strings into other strings, or even cancel a normal into a special move. But I let my expectations of how I think fighting games should work blind me from taking advantage of what is actually there. Extreme Potodin and Great Pirate Coliseum don't feel like your typical 2D tag fighter, but even what seems like a very basic kit can have a lot of sauce when you get creative with it, because many of these buttons and strings have interesting utility. And then when you add in assists, these games get really crazy. I don't mean this lightly when I say that these two games might have the strongest and wildest assists I've ever seen in a tag fighter. So if you're weak hearted and you can't handle playing this 200 IQ level neutral, you might need to take yourself back to an easy game, like Marvel vs Capcom 2. So there are a ton of assists to choose from, and what they can do for you can be downright game changing. Assists act on a timer when used that's unique to each one. And you got basic assists that will come out and do a little attack or heal you, but then you also have assists that take up the whole screen, play neutral for you, are unblockable, or literally just stop the game and set you up for the kill. Earlier I mentioned the assist that's a grown man dressed as a baby. Well his name is Senior Pink and we gotta put respect on his name. But god this has to be one of the strongest and most obnoxious assists I've ever had to deal with in a fighter. Dude comes in and you can barely see him, and he flies you up to the sky, and you could go get a degree and come back and set up your combo by the time he comes back down. Or how about the Metal Coolers Assist, who just straight up fly across the screen as a projectile like 5 times with giant hitboxes. And look at this! Who's reacting to this? You're worried about the beam assist meta? Take a look at this one! So yeah, assists open up the game in a lot of different ways. And if that wasn't enough, switching characters is pretty offensive and safe in these games too. You can continue combos from a tag, or even combo off of a tag, which adds another layer to everything. Again, tag fighters in general are usually volatile and not for everyone, but this takes it to an extreme. But I can't lie, a fighting game degenerate like myself loves this. Matches are chaotic and fun, and hitting your goofy stuff feels cathartic. If you're looking for a balanced game, you're not going to find it in any of these. But this does bring up the interesting question, if these two games are even balanced against each other. I think it's safe to argue that the Dragon Ball characters are much stronger than many of the One Piece characters on average, because their health and damage output is nuts. But at the same time, the One Piece characters can mess you up too, and I generally think that the One Piece assists are crazier and stronger. Thankfully the damage and scramble situations is pretty low, so you can survive a lot of stuff. But of course, the big setups will kill you if you're not careful. So let's finally get around to talking about the cast of these two fighters. Starting off with Extreme Potodin's very safe and familiar list made up of the Z fighters and the various big name villains. I think at the time this was released, this was the first Dragon Ball game I played that had Dragon Ball Super characters, and I remember being especially excited to play as Super Saiyan Blue Goku. The Dragon Ball assists are where we get way more interesting though, because there are literally over 100 assists to choose from. You could pick assists like Bubbles, Launch, Monster Care, or even Goku on a tractor. Anything that pulls from the entirety of Dragon Ball as a series makes me extremely happy. Great Battle Coliseum was made around when the Dress Rosa arc was ending, so the playable characters are mostly made up of the heavy hitters in the story at the time with the added plus of the villain from the One Piece movie, Film Gold, which is pretty cool. And I do of course have to gush that a lot of the characters were giving some extremely cool tools that fit One Piece's super unique movesets. My favorite idea being the implementation of Law's room ability. To make it short for non-One Piece fans, Law has the ability to create an area of space where he can manipulate anything that resides in it called the room. 
Great Pirate Coliseum translates that to him having the ability to create the room, and if he and his opponent are inside of it, all of his sword normals will connect, even if he's a screen away. It's super cool. I also love the assists because they're made up of characters from pre and post time skip, thankfully. So you got characters like Arlong, Shanks, members of Blackbeard's crew, and even goofy stuff like members of the fake Straw Hats. I love it. And again, I briefly mentioned this before, but man these games have some incredible sprite work. Even though these games are 3DS games, Arc System Works thankfully did not cheap out. And while it's a bit sad we'll probably never get to see these characters with such good fighting game sprites ever again, I'm glad that the last ones to do it were Arxis, so we could go out with a bang. Now I want to shout out the reason this video even exists, and point out how a game is truly never dead. Like I said earlier, if it wasn't for the random tech videos that popped up for this game, I probably would have gone the rest of my life thinking that these games had nothing for me to really enjoy. But thanks to Griffy Bones and Troweezy, who are the front runners of getting modern online western discussion for these games started again, I was thankfully able to see that these games have a lot of charm. These two really pushed and developed the meta, while also creating a space for those who already knew these games were awesome to get together with newer fans like me, so we could all discuss how cool these games really are. The One Piece DBZ 3DS community has really come together to help make what should be very inaccessible games really easy to jump into. All of this takes effort, and the group of dedicated players grinding against friends, theory crafting combos, making tier lists, or just talking about these games in general is real art preservation in my opinion, and is what makes these games truly great. But that's enough of my little soapbox. I love Dragon Ball, I now love One Piece, and I really love fighting games, so I'm happy that they've all come together in a way that I can appreciate. I hope for all of our sake that this isn't the last time Arc System Works touches One Piece and I really hope that one day we can get another Dragon Ball vs One Piece game from them. Or even a traditional Shonen Jump crossover fighter in general. Well, a boy can dream. In the meantime, I'll be waiting for the next One Piece chapter, while also waiting for Senior Pink to drop from the sky, setting me up for the dumbest combo possible. Thanks!